as I was approaching half an hour ago, I was welcomed by very, very big and strong words like transference object and separation and so on and so on. And then uh, turning to, what was it, burying psychoanalysis and being depressed about it and so on. Um, let me thank you, first of all, for, for being here, to some of you for being here most of the time or all of the time in a city that offers so many interesting things. I'm, I was not sure this was the best of choices. Tonight, we turn to probably the most ambiguous topic, to the topic that the least books and papers were written about, but that is very important every day, so to say. Some of the psychoanalysts are not scientists. Some psychoanalytic researchers are not clinicians, and so on and so on. But everyone has some sort of professional identification with psychoanalysis. It's a form of treatment for mental disorders, we hope for psychosomatic disorders, and so on and so on. Yet since the times Freudian uh, up to now, it's been insisted this is not a part of medicine. This is something completely different. Psychoanalysis has something that is golden, and medicine would spoil it and make it um, of another less valuable metal. Then psychoanalysis wants to be a science, would like to be a science, yet outside of the university. Again, since the times Freudian until today, probably 99% of psychoanalytic science, 95% maybe today, of psychoanalytic science is outside of the universities. So how does that come to be? All other sciences know where they, their position is. Why would psychoanalysis be out? And then finally, psychoanalysis wants to be a worldview. It wants to tell you how to look at the world, how to understand it, how to interpret it, what your attitude toward other people, especially toward your patients, but to other people should be, and yet outside of the church. So many people wonder, is it a form of secular religion? There are books entitled, Is Psychoanalysis Another Religion? And that's a question that's very serious and we need to address. So our tentative answers to these questions are, we don't work in hospitals, but we work in private practice. We don't work at the universities, but we work in psychoanalytic institutes. And we don't work in churches, but we work in psychoanalytic associations and or societies. So I'll try to review what this looks like. It is very difficult for me to imagine whether you would be interested in this, whether you would be interested in something completely different or complementary to this. So please interrupt me, ask me questions, give us input so that we all have more fun and learn more. So the private practice, everyone should easily know what it is. Most usually, for, for, the, for, 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 for the most part of the 20th century and the first 10 years of this century, it would be you have a room where one person or several persons come and then you are involved in some sort of a psychoanalytic process. Now there is SMS therapy, some of us wanted to become experts in that, there is Skype analysis, there is phone analysis and so on and so on. But then what is it that makes it into a private therapeutic practice? Of course it is how you start and what you ask and what you know about diagnosis and so on, but I think What's most important is ethics. We are outside of the medical system. People may be suspicious of that. And our ethical standards must be the highest possible so that we represent our profession to other professions and to clients in the best possible way. So what is it that we have to, to use for this? One point is what we call the psychoanalytic setting. So we talked about that here and there over the past weeks. It is not just the chairs and the couch and the clock and things like that. It is the setting as a mind frame. How you think about your patient, how you are focused on doing just what is the best for your patient and not what is the easiest or most comfortable for you and so on and so on. That whatever happens in the analytic situation will be understood as analytic material, that you will not look at it 
as an everyday event, but you will always look for the symbols, for the message coming from the unconscious. I also mentioned to you Freud's idea that we need to purify the countertransference. So the countertransference, to remind you, Freud believed were our feelings provoked but what, by what happens in the analytic situation. The patient would have very strong feelings toward the therapist, this called, Freud called transference, and so the patient would feel about the therapist that he or she is the best person in the world or the worst person in the world or uh, one after the other. And then we might react to that. To the hatred of, of the patient, we might react by abandonment and to the positive feelings of the patient, we may react by falling in love or giving too much and so on and so on. So Freud believed we should be purified from Cauten transference. We must not have these strong feelings that might make, might make us do something unethical. We'll, we'll, we'll come in a couple of minutes to the issue of how we could be purified, how Freud thought we could be purified. Freud wrote in one letter about his friend and mentor, Josef Breuer, and his treatment of the woman, young woman whom we call Anna O, Beata Pappenheim, he wrote that Breuer left the treatment because Anna O fell in love with him and fantasized about giving a birth to his child. And, for, and Breuer left, Freud, clay, Freud said, for someone to do something like that, one has to be a Breuer. So to have counter-transferential feelings is something despicable. Freud would despise you. He would think of you as a weakling. You have these feelings. You are a Breuer. So, in order to survive, Freud thought you have to be personally analyzed. You go through the process of personal analysis for one, to learn what it looks like, to learn what analysis is, to see and hear Freud giving you interpretation, and then to experience what it means to be in resistance or to have uh, one or the other sort of insight. But also, Personal analysis will purify you. It will help you realize who you are. You will overcome your own problems, so you will not fall in the trap um, placed by the patient. And also you will learn what is it that you cannot overcome, but you will be aware of that, so you will know what your weak spots, your blind spots are. And finally, and we also talked about that in the years before World War I, Freud wrote a series of so-called technical papers where he gave recommendations as to how we should work with patients. And these recommendations were very strongly about the distance. Be very distant, be emotionally uninvolved, so, again, that you will not fall into the trap. Why was Freud so acutely worried about this. This is a letter from a young woman whose name was Elma Palos. She was the daughter of Shandor Ferenczi's lover, Gisela, and his future wife, who was also analyzed by Ferenczi at the time when he was in love with her mother. And this is a letter she wrote 50 years later to one very important historian of psychoanalysis. All in all, after a few sessions, Shandor, that's Ferenczi, got up from his chair behind me, so in the middle of the session, sat on the sofa next to me, that's on the analytic couch, and, considerably moved, kissed me all over and passionately told me how much he loved me and asked if I could love him too. Whether or not it was true, I cannot tell, but I answered yes, and, I hope, I believed so. So this is before World War I. What did Ferenczi do after this, what do you think? What are you afraid of? The first thing they did, they went to Gisela and told her, I'm not in love with you, I'm in love, in love with your daughter. But not long after that, Elma discovered she was not really in love with Ferenczi. So Ferenczi sent her to Vienna to be analyzed by Freud. 
and Freud advised Ferenczi to marry Gisela. So you see the chaos that today hopefully would not happen, at least not too often. So because of events like this, because of Jungspielrein romantic and sexual affair, because of sexual and financial affairs, so to say, Ernst Jones had in England and in Canada, Freud imposed very strict rules. Today, I think it's very honorable to say there is a lot of discussion, a very open discussion, about boundary violations in psychoanalysis. What is it that makes some psychoanalysts at certain point of their professional careers to do something deeply unethical and also strange to them as persons and to their practice up to that moment? Glenn Gabbard used to be the first person who wrote a book about that and several papers and he did the research. At this moment, many of the psychoanalytic institutes, especially in North America, have subcommittees inside their ethical committees who can give you advice, whom you can call if you think you might be tempted to do something stupid, something unethical. It doesn't have to be stupid. And then they can provide advice. And I think that's a long way and a very positive way. We have to admit, psychoanalysts are humans only. They make mistakes. Let's think about these mistakes and let's think about how we could help them. So Gabbard says, in a nutshell, psychoanalysts who do these things, who, for instance, have sexual relationships with their patients, who marry their patients and things like that, do not do it because they are, in the old vocabulary, psychopaths. They do it mostly out of loneliness. They tend to work so much that they lose personal contact with anyone important. They lose affectionate bonds inside their family if they have families, they have no friends, they have no lovers. The only people they know are patients. Described for the first time by Frieda from Reichmann in her famous paper on loneliness, you end up working 12 or even 15 hours per day and you don't know anyone but patients. So I would say we moved in a positive way. Training analysis is something that is still very controversial. I give you just these numbers. There is something called psychoanalytic electronic publishing. Tens of thousands of psychoanalytic papers are there and more and more books every year and now videos and so on. So when you type training into the subject field, more than 600 papers. When you type education, 362. That was probably a month ago. So try to imagine you want to become a dentist. Why would you read 600 papers? Why would anyone write 600 papers about how to become a dentist? Or you want to become an astrophysicist or a basketball player, whatever. Why 600 papers about that? No reason. Just psychoanalysis somehow cannot find its way and there is always some controversy. So training analysis became, became obligatory during the 1920s. The reason not very deeply into theory. Freud discovered he had cancer. 1923, they diagnosed that the, the tissue that appeared in his mouth was cancerous. He had more than 30 operations in the next 15 years of his life. Then he realized the moment will come that he will not know all the psychoanalysts in the world personally and he will not analyze most of them personally. So until the beginning of the World War I, you became a psychoanalyst so that you come to Vienna and you are in analysis with Freud for some time and he tells you, okay, now you can work. Or you come to Vienna, you impress him very much and he tells you, you don't need analysis, you can start working. After the World War I, many psychiatrists mostly would come from the United States to be analyzed by Freud, they would usually stay for a couple of months, three to six months. They would usually have double sessions, one session in the morning, another session in the afternoon. So 12 sessions per week because Freud worked full time every Saturday. 
If you were in a bad shape, in a bad crisis, he would give you a session on Sunday as well. If you come <coughs> in May, then he would take you to summer vacations. He goes to Holland, to, to the sea, and then you go to the same place and come for sessions. He goes to a spa somewhere, Central Europe, you travel there. In, in many of the cases, I, I believe I mentioned that to you, these psychiatrist patients would also travel with them from the United States to Vienna or to Budapest so that they don't interrupt their own analysis. So, several months, let's say six months, 12 sessions per week, all in all 300 sessions, and you're done. Less if Freud would think so. It may happen you come to Vienna and Freud tells you, go to Ferenczi to Budapest, go to Abraham to Berlin. But he tells you that. He decides. It is his playground. He's the big boy in his playground and he tells you what the rules are. Today, the International Psychoanalytic Association has a strict rule that is expressed in numbers. You have to go at least four times per week for at least four years. So, on one hand, less sessions per week than in Freudian times, because when you come to Vienna, then you don't have anything else to do but go to Freud. Now, when you live in a large city like this and have to go somewhere four times a week and return, that takes a huge amount of time. Very few people would have that much time. In places like Mexico City, they say the public transportation is so chaotic, even if the analyst and the analysand live in the same city, they use Skype because it's impossible to go from one part of the city to the other. On the other hand, these several months are now at least four years. When we say a year, count at least 10 months. So usually, at many places, psychoanalysts don't work August. Not everyone, but, but at some places that's sort of a rule. And then there will be other holidays, travels, and this and that. So counted 10 months, at least four years. So this is hundreds of sessions. I have to tell you that personally, I have never met anyone who finished his or her training analysis in four years. In case someone would finish the analysis that fast, it would be the American way to finish the first training analysis as fast as you can. So you start working, so you pay your debts, loans, and so on and so on, and then later on you go for another analysis for your own. In many of the biographies you, you might want to read one day, you will see 18 years of analysis, 10 plus 10 years of analysis, and so on and so on. It's usually a very long job. Of course, psychoanalysis has been widely criticized for that. So this is the world now when we want quick fix, we want to solve the problem very fast, and who has time to go anywhere for 12 years? I, I, I would say that this is a very important problem for psychoanalysis, because it does exist in the contemporary society. And it cannot pretend that things are not changing, that people are moving much more frequently than they used to, and so on. But on the other hand, I think it's impossible to really finish important jobs quickly. If you think about the number of years that you lived in a dysfunctional way, it cannot be solved over a couple of weeks. It requires time. Psychoanalysis has this very presumptuous idea that it works with causes and it helps you develop. It helps you grow up. Like you look at this tree there, it's very small because it's in this pot and then you want to put it in a larger pot so that it grows a little more and then still larger pot, it grows still more and then you can bring it into a park or into the woods. That requires time. If you take it into the woods now when it's very fragile, you don't know whether it will survive. So it takes time. But we can discuss that. It, it's, it's a very controversial issue. Another problem is, is there any difference between the training analysis and therapeutic analysis? 
So you come to someone and say, I have a problem with this and that, and you start your analysis. Or you come and say, I want to become a psychoanalyst, and you start your analysis. What would be the difference? <coughs> we believe that therapeutic analysis can be done by any psychoanalyst who has graduated or is under supervision. But we also believe in the most societies in the world that training analysis can be done just by a training analyst. So there are super analysts who can train you. What do they do while training you? They listen to you, they observe your transference, they provide interpretation, nothing particularly different. But one thing, when you come for your training analysis, then you're quite boring. You come and you evade admitting, I have a deep problem. But you come and say, I want to become a professional. I want to be a psychoanalyst one day. Especially if you were a psychology student, then you know all these words, then you've read all these papers. Then you come to the couch, and then you want it to be like the papers you've read. And so then you wait for the transference interpretation. And it takes more time for the process really to start, for the emotions and experiences to enter the field. You're more cognitive, you're more narcissistic. Then after a certain time, it's analysis as any other. Yet, we have this very important role and status of the training analyst. We'll return to that soon. My dear friend Jay Frankel from New York borrowed this idea to me, that psychoanalytic world works like a I think the way to pronounce this is pyramidal scheme. Uh, you are familiar with the concept. There is someone at the top who earns huge amounts of money. Based on this, there is a level beneath him or her which earns less money and gives some money to this one. Then these here earn even less and give something to these and then they, they give it to these, and so on and so on. So Jay Frankel's idea I've presented to you here in a way that is more detailed and operationalized. On the uppermost level are the presidents and board members. They travel the world, they make big decisions, everyone claps when they see them, they sign, and so on and so on. We mostly don't know what is it that they discuss behind closed doors, how they make their decisions, based on what do they decide, for instance, whether people in China can be trained via Skype or not. How do they make these decisions? We don't really know. Then we have training analysts. When you want to become a psychoanalyst, you go to one of these and they become your training analysts or your supervisors. So to a certain extent, you depend more or less in different parts of the world on their decisions, on whether they like you, on whether they, whether they think you're boring, whether they cannot stand you, and so on and so on. So large amounts of money will go here. One, one training analysis in Berlin is estimated to cost around 65,000 euro for a period of five to six years. So much of this will go from here up to here somewhere. So then there are full members who hope to become training analysts and there are associate members who hope to become full members and then become training analysts. To become one of these you should present a paper. The paper should have some theoretical benefit, theoretical contribution and should provide a case presentation you must have a certain number of analysis in treatment unsupervised for the certain number of years, which is more or less impossible to check. So then there are honorary members, so usually professors, benefactors, artists, someone interested in psychoanalysis who is not working with clients, but may contribute somehow. And then, as you are struggling to become a psychoanalyst, I don't know where, where it could be here, maybe. Then there are three steps. It, it's crazy hierarchical. I, I cannot stand this hierarchy. 
As you come, you are an applicant. An applicant is allowed just to go to his or her personal analysis and listen to the courses, like this one, for instance. Then they allow you to work with one patient using the couch under supervision, then you are a candidate. And when you have two of these cases, then you are an advanced candidate. Yes? So working on the solution, that means that there is another analysis and the... Yes. Yes. So when... I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate now. So when you become an advanced candidate, then you go for your personal analysis probably four times per week. Then you work with at least one patient on the couch who comes at least four times per week. You make detailed transcripts the best would be just to write down every word from the audio recording. And then you bring that to another training analyst who is then supervising your work. And then you have another patient who comes at least three times per week. Again, transcripts and the third training analyst who is supervising now this case. In the United States, APSA requires three supervisions. And one of the requirements you must be in your personal analysis until at least the first of these supervisions is finished. So it is years. There is a point, I think, I think somewhere here, when it is not so much demanding financially because you start earning from working with patients and you pay for your training out of that, but it takes huge amounts of time. Okay. So, in order to try to avoid this, or to hide this, dep depends on how skeptical you are in your looking at psychoanalysis, we have developed psychoanalytic institutes. These are the institutions always outside of the university. So these are not institutions like Institute for Microbiology, Institute for Astrophysics, or for whatever. It is not an institution which gets money to do research and not teach. It's an institute that should train future practitioners. Psychoanalytic institutes at this moment are probably countless. Fifteen years ago on Manhattan alone they had, I think, 37. And so Berlin, I think, has at least seven or nine. And so on and so on. So training institutes, in the famous words of Otto Kernberg, have four different functions. They, at the same time, are like artistic schools, like technical schools, like religious schools, and like university schools. And that is probably what makes it very complicated. Point one tells you we're dealing with something that is about intuition, about playfulness, about fantasy, that cannot really be put into rules, that you cannot write manuals about. You need to learn while you're listening to the patient to observe your own inner fantasy. While the patient tells you the dream, you have somehow to be inside this dream to see what may be important in that. So it is very unstructured, it is very playful. I, I, I always say, if it's possible to write a manual about it, it is not psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis has this side, which is in a way mysterious. You have no idea why exactly you are singing this song, why exactly you started thinking about your childhood experience, why this patient today reminds you of another patient three years ago, and you have to somehow discover, and that discovery will not be cognitive, will not be straightforward, will be completely anti-scientific, if you will. This is, if you remember in the words of John Bowlby that I quoted, this is where you want to be as subjective as possible. You want to be more and more subjective as the sessions go on. At the same time, there is a trade, and you have to learn these things. What about timing? What about keeping the setting? What about payment? What about how you open the door and present yourself? 
how will you connect to other colleagues, how will you pay your insurance, and so on and so on. So like every art form has its trade, so does psychoanalysis. Probably we don't think about that, and some people believe that if you think about that, then it becomes less idealized, so to say. But there is technology behind preparing ice cream as well. There is technology behind preparing violins that will play in the orchestra, and so on and so on. So, it exists here. We usually like it narcissistically to think about other things, but not about these everyday things that still exist. Then we have this point which to my mind is deeply problematic. Psychoanalysis which re resembles religious schools deeply, where there is one source of truth, in our case Freud most usually, or another guy who would replace Freud, in the opinion of his followers, and then we don't try to discover, we don't try to test, we don't think scientifically, we are not happy when we prove ourselves wrong, but we believe the truth is in the interpretation of our dreams or here or there. And then finally, something that is very rare, but starts to emerge in recent years, and that is psychoanalytic institutes devoted to research, devoted to the generation of new knowledge. This is not to be confused with university departments where psychoanalysis is studied. So there are here and there university departments. I, I guess for most of them I would be able now to remember, to, to, to recall their names and tell you that there are very few where you can go and become a PhD in psychoanalysis, a Master of Arts in psychoanalysis. But they do not provide clinical training. In most of the cases, once you finish that, you will not be a clinical psychoanalyst. Then you have to go for your personal analysis and the supervision to be able to work with, with patients. There is one example that goes contrary to this, that is Emory University in Atlanta, in Georgia. They provide both. And there is, some people believe, very exciting new trend in Finland. All the institutes were required by law to return to the university. So now all psychotherapy training in Finland is inside the university. But how it will work at this moment, I don't think anyone knows. We have different models how these institutes are organized. For probably 80 something years, there was just one official model. And that is this tripartite or Eitikton or Berlin model. This is the model that was devised in the mid 1920s after Abraham died and Eitikton for a certain time became the president of the Berlin Society and of the International, and he came up with this idea. You go for your theoretical seminars so that you learn what it is, you go for your personal analysis to get the experience and be purified, and you get supervised. Two, th two times, three times, uh, individually in a group, this or that. And until 2007, this was the only official model. All the other models were considered, so to say, non-IPA, non-kosher. If it's non-IPA, then you don't touch it. Then it is something core. The French model, and yes, this model is a non-reporting model. So you finish your personal analysis, and no one will dare ask your analyst, is this a person who will be a good clinician? And he, he or she must not say that. The French model, politically probably more self-reflective. You go for your analysis, you apply to a society. They give you your analyst. They give you the name, you go to this person, you start your analysis. It may happen to you that this person does not live in the same city where you live. Survive. You finish your analysis. Your analyst writes a report. This report goes to the French 
or Parisian or they also have many societies. And then based on this report, they decide whether you will be allowed to start your training in, 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 in true. So if your analyst says that you have too many problems of this or that kind, and he or she believes that might be troublesome for your future patients, then these years of training are worth nothing. What might be good in the French model? At one moment, I, I suggested to my colleagues in Belgrade to turn from, from the first model to the second one. In the first model, you start your analysis. You're on the couch, transference, problems, conflicts, dreams, and so on and so on. And then your analyst is present at the meetings, and he, may, he or she may give seminars, and then you know who goes to this person for analysis as well, and then you either hate them or you're in love with them, and then you know that your analyst might like or dislike another analyst, so you will like or dislike them, and so on and so on. So that leads to a huge problem in the world of psychoanalysis, which I don't think exists in other professions. Everyone is something to everyone else. Everyone is somehow connected. Even in large cities like London or New York, psychoanalysts are not that many, and everyone is something to everyone else. The French model, you go to your analysis, and you know nothing about the society. You have no idea whether there are seminars and who your analyst is married to or was married to and so on and so on. You have no idea about that. You only have your personal analysis. You can completely focus on it and not in any way uh, distort it. After it's finished, then you go to seminars and supervisions and then the possible presence of your psychoanalyst is completely unimportant to you. Finally, there is the third official model developed in a small country in Latin America where for many years and probably decades people had to challenge the dictatorship. So then they developed a model of psychoanalytic training that will contain no dictatorship. It is, I don't think it's applied anywhere else in the world, but it has to go to everyone's liking, I think. It is very pluralistic. So there are many institutes everywhere which are Kleinian or anti-Kleinian, independent or anti-independent, and so on. Uruguay model, teach whatever you want. Teach whatever you like. Try to teach as many different things as possible so that people would hear uh, many different models. And then this model is recognized by the state, and once you finish the training, you get your Master of Arts in Psychoanalysis. To the best of my knowledge, no one else managed to, to obtain that for their candidates anywhere in the world. Neither of these models includes any form of scientific training. So you become a psychoanalyst without a single lecture in the philosophy of science, in the methodology, in the history of science, nothing. A model for that, a model based on research was presented last year in the Psychoanalytic Inquiry Journal by Andrew Gerber, the current director of the Austin Riggs Hospital. And it is really based on research. Every year of training, at least one large seminar is about how to conduct research. So far, again, to the best of my knowledge, not a single Psychoanalytic Institute decided to switch from one of these models to that. Why is all this specially important? I return to the topic I mentioned frequently. People who come to study psychology, people who come to start their psychoanalytic training, we call, since the times of Carl Gustav Jung, wounded healers. These are the people particularly sensitive, very often traumatized, very often growing up with someone who needed help so that they are used to providing containment, revitalization, or whatever you will. They come to these institutes. Now, these are just some... This is Ferenczi, his concept of compulsory caregiving. Traumatized children who start believing they are ill or they are evil may 
develop this compulsory caregiving and devote their lives to being pediatricians, psychoanalysts, or something like that. And then large studies with American and European psychoanalysts and psychotherapists show that most of them report having very troublesome childhoods. That we come here because we're looking probably for something for ourselves, and then just we provide for the others as well. If you then take these people so sensitive and turn them into these very impersonal models and turn them into this, they might suffer a lot. So something I think very deep needs to be changed in this. What? In the system of psychoanalytic training. It is, it is incredibly complex. It is more complicated than simply you go to the university to become a psychologist. It is more complicated. Because this that is in you will one day in the middle of your personal analysis come to the surface. All the pains that you were not able or were not in a situation to face, now you will start facing. So it will be very turbulent for a moment. At the same time, you will go to seminars and listen about which year, who wrote what about what. You will think about your loyalty to your institute, your supervisor, or this or that. So at the moment when you're most sensitive, you will also face a very impersonal side or a very, I consider it a dark side of psychoanalysis, rumors, institutional uh, power struggles and so on and so on. What is it that should be changed, I think is extremely difficult to say. Kernberg, for one, devoted hundreds of pages over the last 30 years to this issue. He wrote one paper which is entitled 30 Ways to Destroy the Creativity of Psychoanalytic Candidates. He listed the ways that we use in psychoanalytic institutes to destroy the creativity. Never ask them what they think. Always start with Freud. And then their opinion, they should learn as soon as possible, is not important. And so on and so on. I think one of the problems that we have to face, while, for instance, dentists do not, is what I already mentioned. Everyone is something to everyone else. In a way, very unconscious, we are all connected in the world of psychoanalysis. If you look at the history of psychoanalysis, it's always three or four steps, either to Freud or to Ferenczi. And then they analyzed so many people. And then rivalries and marriages, everything goes together. Melanie Klein wanted Winnicott to analyze her son, which he did. She wanted to supervise that analysis. 20 years later, she analyzed his second wife. He wrote her letters in the same time, please support my creativity. Everyone is so close to other people. Then I think there is another problem related to clinical practice. Because we have this very high ethical standards. And we have a very challenging task to really listen about traumatic experiences of other people. That's very difficult. I think then we manage to contain other people's pain while in sessions. And then when you go to meetings, then we become beasts. We are I wouldn't say angels, but we are very, very good image of humankind as we listen to patients and contain their pain and try to help. And then we go to meetings, to conferences and so on and so on, and then everyone hates everyone and people fight over crazy things and so on and so on. The dark side, the, the back side of our job, I think, is then acted, acted out in our societies. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit different, it doesn't matter, like the church, like mm -hmm. the tax, whatever. Yeah. This institute exists, and this institute is in charge by the state. 
for the saints, for example, is not um, getting spiritual features. The saints are not involved in details. And it's just become another tool of the state, another use of the state. There's people that earn money, just like position, and nobody wants to hear anything else. It just exists. And society doesn't go through a real healing. People, if you take psychoanalysis from the 19th century till today, psychoanalysis failed to be society. People yeah. are not that sick as well in the 19th century. People are not that sick. Less, not less sick. And not less. Not. No, no, they're not. They're not. Psychoanalysis, I will return to that, was strongly challenged from the outside by other psychotherapists, by pharmacological industry, by rapidity and this and that, by the change of the worldview, the dominant worldview and so on. And then the response of psychoanalysis to this challenge was, to my mind, completely wrong. So not, I don't think we should bury psychoanalysis tonight. We should start thinking together, hopefully, how to reply to these challenges better. I will return to this briefly. <coughs> so psychoanalytic society is very important. Some psychoanalysts believe what early Christians used to believe. No psychoanalyst outside of the psychoanalytic society system. So you may remember that. Sine ecclesia nulla salis. Outside of the church, no salvation. Outside of the psychoanalytic societies, no psychoanalysts. What do they look like? What are they for? So Freud wrote in 1914 his historical summary of the psychoanalytic movement, he called it at that time, as if it was a political movement. And he said, in the year 1901, I had no followers. And I remember this sentence very clearly because I was really puzzled by it. Why would you like to have followers? What are the followers for? I would personally consider them a burden only. He never says I didn't have collaborators, I didn't have a mentor, I didn't have friends. He doesn't mention that. He didn't have followers. So the year after that, 1902, Freud, Steckel, Adler, and two other guys started meeting in Freud's apartment Wednesday evenings. So these were Freud's Wednesdays, and immediately it was called Wednesday Psychological Society. Four members and Freud, and it's a society. What were they doing? They were discussing Freud's work. So they didn't say, we will do a research study about that. We will read a book and then we will discuss it. We will talk about anthropological... No, they were discussing Freud's work. So over the next couple of years, it grew to 14, and it became a Vienna Psychoanalytic Society. At that moment, Jung was in, Ferenczi was in, Freud very strongly hoped Kreplin and Bloiler would be in, so two most important psychiatrists in the German-speaking world. They never really were in. But the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society was formed. At more or less the same time, Ferenczi founds the Budapest Society, Jung founds uh, Zurich Society. I think 1913 the American was founded. This is, this is it, EPSA, American Psychological Association. And so in 1910 they have a meeting in Salzburg and they found the International Society, 50 members. I, again, personally wouldn't consider when there are 50 of us that we would have to make a formal organization with presidents and structures and so on and so on. Let's work on something. But I may be a dinosaur. There are 50, they meet in Salzburg, they all want to make a society that will protect Freud's theory from the non-believers. And what happens immediately, they have a fight over who's going to be the president. Because Freud says he's not going to be the president. He's too much a godlike figure to, be, to have a political role. So who's going to be the president? Freud says someone from Zurich. Why? Because they're not lousy Jews like you are the Viennese group. So he wants psychoanalysis 
to be considered in, the, in Europe, in the European university community, not as a Jewish science. Already by that time there were accusations this is a Jewish science. So Freud wants Jung, an Aryan, to be the president so other people will, would accept his science more. So what happens is that poor Ferenczi comes to the sage and says Viennese group, Zurich group, realize the Zurich group is better and they should give a president. And the Viennese group gets offended and they retreat into a room and there they discuss how they should so, like the most horrible political warfare that, that would, to my mind, be so boring that I could die if I were present there. Sorry? Who gave the money? Who gave the money for what? I, I'm not aware of, of any serious money at that moment. There was, there was important money later on, 1918, 1919s. There were millionaires in Budapest, in the United States, in Switzerland, who gave huge amounts of money. Eitington was rich, and the spy involved in the assassination of Trotsky and this and that. But in 1910, I'm not sure there, there was any big money in it. There was, I mean, that's my impression when I read history books. There was, the enthusiasm, the zeal of early Christians. We have the word that we need to spread to the world. I don't think it was about money. It was about whom Freud would like best, and things like that. Yes. Someone later on gave money for the publishing house, to publish books, to publish journals, and so on and so on. I'm not aware of any big money in 1910. Maybe I overlooked, but I didn't see that information. So the International Psychoanalytic Association is now more than 100 years old, now has more than 13,000 members, and now there are so many societies it is impossible to count. What is the destiny of these societies? They always split. So wherever you look, there are at least two. You are aware of that? In Germany, you have two. You have many institutes, they belong to one of the two societies. One goes with the IPA, the other one doesn't. So, I mean, let me give you this example. Belgrade is in the number of citizens twice smaller than Berlin, so somewhere around 1.6 million. And the average salary, I think, is around 400 euro. So psychoanalysis is very expensive there. It's very difficult to afford it. Yet Belgrade at this moment has two psychoanalytic societies, one society for psychoanalytic psychotherapy, one society for child analysis, and a Jungian society. So that's crazy. And, and the group analysis. I didn't mention group analysis. So to my mind, this is complete madness. In a situation when psychoanalysis is weak and demanding and so on and so on, we need to unite. And whenever at a meeting in Belgrade I would say we need to unite, they would think I was completely crazy. So all the societies had this destiny of quarrels and splits. The first of these are these very famous early conflicts. So the nearer you were to Freud, the closer you were to him personally and professionally, the further away he needed to kick you out. In the interpretation of dreams in one of the later editions, Freud writes how he has an unconscious urge, a need, to make an enemy out of a close friend. So it happened more or less with everyone. The last 10 or, or, or 15 years, the only persons that were close to Freud were female. He corresponded with women, he analyzed women, a woman helped him, 
run out of Vienna, and so on and so on. All the men were sent away. So I wouldn't go into, into all of these details. It would take us weeks, probably, to, to describe all these situations. Some of the moments we cannot be very proud of. Freud wrote about Steckel that he was a Jewish pig. And Freud and Jung wrote so many papers against one another. And Freud met with others to make plans how to fight against Jung, and so on and so on. If you want to know more, then for probably each of these situations, they are very reliable book, books. Paul Rosen wrote a book about this, um, about Tausk affair, uh, Dear D. Bear published a biography of Jung, and so on and so on. But what is important? Let's imagine they were chemists and they don't agree. Then they go to the lab, they try to devise an experiment and see what experiment shows. And then they see who was right, who was wrong, and they turn to another topic. In the world of psychoanalysis, something like that is impossible. Freud says the most important thing is infantile sexuality and the sexual drive. Jung says there are more important sources of motivation than that. How do you solve the puzzle? How do you solve who is right and who is wrong? So, it is probably impossible to think of any scientific discipline which involves the concept of dissidence. Dissidents were those guys mostly in the Soviet Union and Soviet occupied countries who would not follow the doctrine of dialectical materialism. There were specific diagnoses for them. They were either killed or sent to Siberia or sent to psychiatric hospitals. Few of them were allowed to emigrate. How would you apply these concepts, completely political, to the world of science? Who would be the dissident from Newtonian physics? Who would be the dissident of the periodic system? It would be crazy to think like that. Yet. Explicitly, we had this idea that we had to spread the word, the word of Freud. In Freud-Jung correspondence, Freud writes things like, um, I am the Messiah and you are my Pope. No, I am, I am Saint Peter and you are my Pope. Then at other places, I am the Messiah and you are my Saint Peter. So there are so many of these religious ideas all the time. And then there are military ones. Sexual theory is the fortress we must defend. Everyone will attack the idea of infantile sexuality. We must be prepared to defend it best. And then this is the language that is used. Sorry? Yes. Yes. Yes, unfortunately, there, there are very important intellectuals who supported the war, usually conservative right-wing ones, but great artists like Thomas Mann and Rilke wrote that the war will bring purification and so on and so on. Freud was quite enthusiastic at a certain time. Everyone who would be, who would be opposing to psychoanalysis in Belgrade would quote a letter where he says, um, Serbia should get a slap in the face because the start of the war was between Serbia and Austria. And then his two sons were drafted and one was wounded and then he started realizing it is not a fairy tale. But I think these very military metaphors were present before and after. He, he simply had this. He claimed he had the temperament of conquistador. So he, he was... He believed the military type of a guy. So these two expressions are completely religious. They are about how some ideas, some, some currents in the world of Christianity separated and so on and so on. And this last one 
is, I think, from 2007. Hannah Siegel, one of the most important followers of Melanie Klein, and she was around 90 years of age, or 90-something, when she wrote that people like Winnicott and Cohut keep their patients in a lie, and that only Freud, Klein, Bion is the line of development of true psychoanalysis. Whatever is outside of this line is not psychoanalysis. So completely religious or um, ideological form of thinking. So I don't know whether you can see it very well now under the light. If there is anything in the world of psychoanalysis I'm embarrassed about, then this is it. This is it. When the Jung Freud divorce started, then there were many papers that were written against Jung, and of course many papers Jung wrote against Freud. But Freud would then tell Ferenczi, write a review of Jung's latest book and kill it. And then he would do that and publish it in one of the other of the journals. And so then the seven decided to make what is now called the secret committee. They would write circular letters, more or less every day, to one another. So this is the time before email and CC and BCC. So this is the time when they wrote by hand. So they would write six letters every day. They would censor papers. They would decide which paper would be allowed to be published, which not. Then who could become a psychoanalyst. Then things like Steckel is a Jewish pig and things like that would be in these letters. They were secret, no one else knew about that. They would meet from time to time, usually once a year, spend several days together, and discuss the politics of psychoanalysis. The basic idea, to defend the Freudian doctrine. The book which gives you probably all the details about that, written by a very reliable historian, Elizabeth Young Brill, is entitled The Secret Ring, because all the guys had the same ring with Oedipus on it. Yeah, horrible. You don't know whether it's more childish or more gay or more what. So they would know that they were the members because they wore the special ring. Then when Ferenczi wanted to go out of that, and I think rank first, then they sent the ring back to Freud. And that was the sign that the marriage was over. So you have inside the world of psychoanalysis, like a central committee of the Communist Party, which does the censorship, makes decisions completely undemocratically, completely hidden from the others. To my mind, the darkest spot in the history of psychoanalysis. So out of this, we have a climate which produces competing schools. We now have dozens of versions of psychoanalysis which compete one with the other. More or less each of these guys, for instance, very, very particular with Lacan, with Wilhelm Reich as well, um, to some extent with Kohut, they would tell you, I'm the only one who can read Freud properly. I'm the only one who understands what Freud meant to say. You are reading Freud in a wrong way. So listen to me, and I will provide to you a return to Freud. That was the idea. I have the return to Freud. Then, in the United States, with Kohut, with Mitchell, with some contemporary authors, people started saying, let's forget about Freud. I told you about that. There is a book, Rescuing Psychoanalysis from Freud. So, Try to imagine this anywhere in the world of natural science. That you have six nuclear physics, six molecular biologists. That when you go from one university to the other, they tell you, oh, that's completely stupid that you learned about the cells. The cells are completely different than they told you in Heidelberg. Try to imagine you go to a dentist and he tells you, oh, I'm from this other school, so I'll work on your teeth in a completely different way. And what this other guy did, that's completely stupid. That's 19th century. I cannot imagine this happens anywhere but with us. 
It happens in the world of arts, of course. Yeah. Yes. So, so, so in terms of Copenhagen, as far as I can understand it, although I've never been to Copenhagen, 98% of the stuff they would agree on, 2% of the stuff they would have competing interpretations. And what they would like to do is find an experiment that would prove or disprove. They, they as far as I know, still have not managed to, to make this crucial experiment, but they would like to. In the humanities that happens, in the world of philosophy that happens, you may be a Hegelian or Heideggerian or this or that, and then you hate the other guys, and then you devote your life into discovering how your guy was the most original of them all. Yes, it happens in philosophy and, and in arts. But Copenhagen in the natural sciences, I would say, is different. If you look at Newton or Einstein, it's different. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that we also see some yeah. some, some, some. Yes. Yes. Some. But, but I, I mean, probably we should take into account that, that, that according to Freud himself, he, psychoanalysis is trying to establish itself as brand new science in, around, around that. Yes. That was so our, that our discussion more than a month ago. Is it a science? There was a guy who was a very important mathematician in Germany more than 100 years ago, but he also played chess. And he used to say, I prefer chess to mathematics because if anyone challenges me, I can, I can beat him, I can win in a chess game. I cannot win in mathematics. So it is not absolutely perfect in natural sciences, but they have the meta language and to the basics they agree. They know that the basics, that atoms exist, and so on and so on. Then they quarrel about, about finesse, I would say. So what could be the future of psychoanalysis? It probably is impossible to say. The world is changing so rapidly, it's impossible to say anything about the future. I have to say, when it comes to the future of psychoanalysis, I personally am not very optimistic. I think the world goes the other way and psychoanalysis must give an extra effort into going somewhere together with the world. There was, for a very long time, a very, I think, narcissistic trend of we know what we're doing. The world is a completely different issue. We know what we're doing, the world may come to us, or may decide not to come to us, but we don't care. We know that what we do is right. Over the last couple of decades, psychoanalysis has changed dramatically, I would say. Psychoanalytic psychotherapy has become accepted. You don't have to use the couch. People don't have to come four times per week. Psychoanalysis became more open to research, more open to connections with other disciplines more going out of the consulting room, and so on and so on. It is most probably getting, it is getting weaker and weaker, most probably everywhere in Western Europe and the US. One exception may be countries like Germany, where the health insurance system would pay for psychoanalysis, so there it would survive better. And countries like France, where psychoanalysis is still alive in their university system. If you look across Western Europe, wherever people need to pay for themselves, psychoanalysis is not nearly as strong as it used to be. Then, as the opposite to that, there are 3,000 psychoanalysts in Buenos Aires alone. On top of these 3,000, a Lacanian Institute, which they do not count together with them. So out of 13,000 members of the international, 3,000 are in one city. 
I have never been there, I cannot imagine it. It should be a 10 million people city, but 3,000 psychoanalysts. And I was told they all have work, they, they all survive. It is not that some are working, some are not. After the fall of the wall, after the fall of communism, psychoanalysis became extremely popular in Eastern Europe. I've seen that with, with, with my own eyes and heard many stories about that. I, I, I will not take too much of your time. But my professors were not allowed to write papers or to supervise dissertations on psychoanalysis. If you would like to propose a doctoral dissertation about psychoanalysis, then someone would jump to their feet and tell you, we have dialectical materialism, we don't need that bourgeois stuff. And that would be the end of the discussion about psychoanalysis. Late 1950s, a counseling serving for children and adolescents based on psychoanalytic ideas was founded in Belgrade and then closed four years later by the political decision. And then as the wall fell, Freud translated into all of the languages. Now psychoanalytic societies exist in Irkutsk, in Novosibirsk, and places like that. One friend of mine once went for a psychoanalytic conference, I think to Novosibirsk, and then he asked where to go for a walk, and they told him, sir, it's minus 35 here, no one walks here. So psychoanalysis has reached these places. The last 10 to 15 years, we see a huge interest in psychoanalysis in India, China, and Korea. So many people are now being trained in the, trained in the United States and Europe and returning there to work, and many people are being trained via Skype. And so there is a discussion whether Skype training is a real training or not, Horst Kechel doing a research to see whether people improve or not. What is very important, I have been at the last two congresses by the, the IPA and at the last congress of the APSA, and you see a completely different face. So when you look at this, psychoanalysis doesn't look like that anymore, at all. So you see more women than men, you see people of all ages, people dressed in all kinds of ways, not so uniformly. Uh, you see people from Latin America, from Korea, from India, from everywhere. The most important authors in the world of psychoanalysis today have names that these guys would not know how to pronounce. We always have problem with, with the most important books like, is it Eche Goen or Eche Gojen, or how do you pronounce it, in fact? And everyone quotes the book. It's one of the most important books published in the last quarter of the century. Now, I return your attention to the number of 13,000. It is probably a small section of a small village somewhere in China. So 10 years from today, we may be 40,000 and the Chinese decide on everything. 13,000 all over the world today. In the International Psychoanalytic Association, yes. So there are psychoanalysts who don't care about the IPA, who are not members, who are against the IPA, who are opposing it. There are Jungian analysts and so on and so on. But the IPA has 13,000. So in the period 2007, no, 2005 to 9, the president of the international, of the IPA, was an analyst from Brazil. Isaac is his name. And he's, he's like a Umberto Eco type of a figure, like a Pavarotti type of a figure. So he goes to China. There is a conference in Shanghai about what to do with the interest in psychoanalysis in China. No one has an idea what is the Oedipus complex in China, what are the attachment patterns in China, transference interpretation. No one knows what to do. And so these large charismatic men says at a certain moment, I still have no idea where is the position of China on the roadmap of psychoanalysis. And then 
what he is not used to and what he does not like very much, he's interrupted by a small Chinese guy who says, well, Mr. President, I also wonder where is the position of the IPA on the roadmap of China? So that may be a very important question. How is psychoanalysis going to change theoretically and practically and as an organization when it opens for the huge number of people who are now being traded in India and in China? At this moment, the international psychoanalytic has three regions, Europe, North America, and South America. Japan goes with North America. But now there is a big discussion whether Asia should become the fourth region. And then what would these introduction of the fourth region change? These are some of the numbers. Sometimes numbers clarify. This is a profession for middle-aged and old people. 70% of German psychoanalysts are at the age 50 to 70. It takes years to graduate from the university. It then takes years to graduate from the Psychoanalytic Institute. In the meantime, you may have this ridiculous idea of having a family or having some free time or going for a vacation um, or sparing some money. So it take year, takes years. At each of these conferences that I've just mentioned to you, I've met a large number of people who are 80, 85, 90, and still writing books, working with patients, traveling around the globe, and so on and so on. Otto Kernberg, who is 88, came to Munich last year, I think for two days, because there was a charity dinner. They wanted to raise money for a professorship in psychoanalysis somewhere in Munich. So he came from New York for the dinner, and the next day he returned to the United States. Now think of us, how most of us must be soft when we travel across the ocean, we need a couple of days to return to our sleep patterns and so on and so on. Kernberg travels as if nothing happens. Some of them publish their books until the age 100, literally. Some of them, uh, one of them, for instance, Martin Bergman, in an interview said, when I turned 90, I decided I had to cut down on the clinical work. So I wouldn't work more than 30 clinical hours per week. So I dare not try to imagine how much he worked before that. On the other hand, I have never seen so many people so skillful in, in, in the discipline which is still not at the Olympics and that's how to sleep in the chair. I, I, cannot, I, I cannot even try to imitate this talent to find the angle for your spine and then sleep for several minutes, and then like, I'm in the lecture again, I'm listening all the time, don't worry. <coughs> there is a book in German that some of my colleagues here at the IPU think that students should not read. Its title is The Sleep of Psychoanalysts. It discusses why we sleep in the sessions, what we should do when it happens, and so on and so on. So this old age, I think it's remarkable that people are so alive for so long. I believe it comes from the constant reflecting on emotional world of other people and yourself. You, you cannot become emotionally dead or emotionally old if you have patience. But then on the other hand, you have to nap from time to time. So, all across the US, 100 people apply per year. And it grows less and less. So this is the country of 320 million people. If you look for psychiatry, if you look for cognitive behavioral therapy or anything like that, the numbers would be far, far different. So, if you, I know that in Belgrade usually we would have one or two candidates per year and CBT Institute would have 40 per semester. So the difference is huge. The number of people in treatment, psychoanalysis, psychoanalytic, psychotherapy, whatever, is 5,000 again in a country of 320 million. I think it is 
It may be good for a research study, but this is not a force as it used to be. So most of these 5,000 are not in high frequency treatment. Not four times per week, not five times per week. Once a week, maybe once in two weeks, at best twice a week. Then if psychoanalysis is present in universities, it is present in the humanities, little less in the social sciences, very little in psychology departments. If it's present, then the reference word is Freud. Personality psychology textbooks, there is a paper even about that. Most widely used personality psychology textbooks in the States present psychoanalysis in a wrong way and very outdated way. Psychoanalysis is Freud, Jung and Adler. And nothing happened after them. And then even when they try to, to talk about them, even that's wrong. And finally, there is a very important book published in 2009 about the bankruptcy of the analytic press, the most important American publishing house that many of their books you must have read so far. The print runs of psychoanalytic books were tens of thousands several decades ago. The most famous psychoanalytic book of all time is Eric Fromm's The Art of Loving, which was published in 25 million copies across the globe. Many of these 25 probably thought it was about something completely different than it is. But anyway, at that time, psychoanalysts would sell huge print runs. The most important authors of today sell 300, 800 is something many dream about. No one sells 2,000 anymore. It's impossible to sell a psychoanalytic book in 2,000 copies. And 2,000 is, I mean, that's internationally. 2,000 is nothing. So how do we report, how, how do we, how do we um, reply to this marginalization? In the world of mental health care, in the university world, in, in bookstores, here and there, we are not the force we used to be. So how do we reply to it? I don't know whether you would believe me, but I think in this way. I think this is how we treat this problematic situation. One form of our response is fragmentation. Can you read it? Should I read it? So, he says, I used to hate writing assignments, but now I enjoy them. I realized that the purpose of writing is to inflate weak ideas, obscure poor reasoning, and inhibit clarity. With a little practice, writing can be an intimidating and impenetrable fog. Want to see my book report? So the title is, The Dynamics of Interbeing and Monological Imperatives in Dick and Jane, A Study in Psychic Transrelational Gender Modes. And he says, academia, here I come. So one reply we use is fragmentation. The pressure from the outside is higher and higher, and we fragment on the inside. We do not explode, we do not organize so that we stop the pressure, we fragment. So now inside psychoanalysis there is, there is a frightening fragmentation. I was told once at the meetings of the British psychoanalytic, if we imagine that this is the room, it must be much larger where they meet, and this is the stage, then first several rows are for training analysts. Then the middle section is for full members, and back sit the associate members. And then to, the, to one side, now in this dimension, are the Kleinians, and here are the independents. The Anafreudians more or less do not exist anymore. And no one shakes hands with people outside of their zone. They are divided, so this is status, this is ideology, and you communicate only with people who are inside your box. Fragmentation? No. I mean, I was told this 10 years ago, but I, I wouldn't say it's, it's improved. Another point is mystification. The world tells us Psychoanalysis makes no sense. And we tell them, 
this may be a self-object transference or maybe a projective identification. And they have no idea what the language that we are using means. It's completely uh, intimidating and impenetrable fog. Try to imagine someone from another discipline trying to read contemporary psychoanalytic literature. They would not be able to follow anything. Again, I return to this issue that brings me a lot of pain. We don't have a meta-language. And finally, we enjoy, in a way, in our isolation. We believe that we have the word, that we have the knowledge, that we have the technique of work with patients. And so it's the problem of the world that it is stupid and ignorant, and the day will come when the world will realize. Then they will come to learn from our truth, to drink from our source. So what I meant to tell you with all this, I think the situation is not very optimistic and we need to work on it. We need to think and work on better response to this marginalization. There are here and there, to my mind, better responses. You may, you may look, for instance, at something that we already mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the work of Jonathan Shadler, who now does many outcome studies to show whether psychoanalysis is effective or not, to compare psychoanalysis fairly to cognitive behavioral therapy and show what goes on there, and so on and so on. But that is not enough. We need to think of better and other ways. So, so... Okay. Yeah, of course. Imagine, imagine I, I talk all, all the evening about non-democratic trends in psychoanalysis and now don't allow questions. No, of course. I'm very suspicious why psychoanalysis has been adopted by government and by medical why psychology is so um, uh, taken by the system. When we talk about China, we cannot avoid seeing adaptation of psychoanalysis and economical development. People lose their traditional structure, they go to cities, they are individualized. Now they are not happy because they lose their social connection. And I think this is the main problem today in the world. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that we don't have real social connection. So they lose the social connection. Now they are not happy. What's the solution? They go and speak about themselves in the psychology. Yes. Now, up to I this point, I can agree completely. Many people would say we go to psychoanalysis because we don't have friends. Many people used to say psychoanalysis came to the world at the moment when religion became irrelevant, so you wouldn't go for confession, you would go for psychoanalysis. But whether Chinese people used to have an institution where they would go to talk to someone, I have no idea. Do you know? I think maybe in the village, mm -hmm. some kind of institution. I, uh -huh. was I assume that inside the community there's something going on. There's some maybe. Bigger than give this answer. But if we go to the couch, okay, so I think I, I, it's a very interesting book of confronting the matter of confronting the self. And it shows that the couch, as a type of sex, also increased individualism, that the person thinks that the sources of this problem yes. is him, is inside yes. him, is yes. the society. Yes, no doubt. And I think if I were good and can reach the other thing, even Freud, maybe you was the only one in his daily life, they were not going to wash any food. They were not saying, the psychoanalysis is not pushing the individual outside of himself. Mm. Go to, to the things that are outside of the world. Go to God, go to whatever. This is when I'm talking about the problem. I, I personally would agree to, 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 to most of what you said. I also can tell you that many of my colleagues don't agree. I thought, and I talked several times from, with my colleagues about the possible social role of psychoanalysis. So no doubt psychoanalysis is one of the technologies of the self. It returns you to the self-reflection, and so you become more individualized. No doubt about that. And then how many people were analyzed so that this was developed in them? I don't know. Is it 
enough to change something in the society? I don't know. I had a very optimistic idea that if you look at societies in the 20th century which had a period of totalitarian regime, then, to the best of my knowledge, Germany addressed this issue and guilt and responsibility better than any other nation. Better than Spain, Spain, better than Serbia, better than Russia, better than Hungary, and so on and so on. Here, there was a dialogue, there was a discussion. Here, when you walk the center of the city, there are memorials. And I thought it may be due to the presence of psychoanalysis, due to psychoanalysis being homegrown here. And my German colleagues think that this is completely naive, that psychoanalysis never had a, such a strong social role, that never that many people were analyzed so that that would be important. So I don't know. It's difficult to say. I would tend to agree with you, but many wouldn't. That's the best I can say. It is, it is difficult for me to say. On, on the other hand, I'm personally a dinosaur. So I don't understand many of the things that are very important at this moment. Many young people go to musical festivals where they spend several days dancing with extremely loud music and shining lights, sometimes ecstasy and things like that. Is that oceanic feeling? I don't know. I've never experienced it. Some sociologists say that partner dancing has disappeared. They go where 2,000 people will be and everyone will dance alone. I don't know. Then the internet. Is it a form of oceanic feeling? Is it a form of I'm connected to the whole, okay, not universe, but planet, everyone, everywhere? I don't know. Maybe someone younger would be able to, to say something wiser. No. Yes, ecstasy. Yeah. It is it is I think the old the ancient word word ecstasy to go outside of your current state of being. You have your stasis and then you go exo, you go outside of it and you become united. It's a Dionysian feeling, if you will. It's, it's the feeling that Nietzsche would have while listening to music. Where is it today? I don't know. Does anyone have any, any idea? I just, I just told Masha during the break. There was a concert last Wednesday and one of the Belgrade students after the concert, I would say, could not speak for half an hour and he just kept repeating, I have now heard music for the first time in my life. It happens to some people sometimes individually. I don't know. I, I guess the reason that you have put up fragmentation, mystification and isolation is not because you personally believe that this is sort of the right strategy or... No, I, 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 I hope I, I was clear. I think this is a very frequent current response, but I think we should work on a better response. We must think something better or we'll be in a great danger. So, so I would like actually to, to, to pose the question, I, I think I revealed it already to a couple of guys outside, but if, if we return to Freud, um, why is it that we're still talking about Freud? What is the so the essence of what Freud tried to do? Why are we talking about Freud today, 2016? Yeah, and, and, and what, what, what was the essence of what Freud was, you know, the, the 
They say that two persons about whom most books were written about in the last hundred years were Freud and Hamlet. There are books about Freud everywhere. There are papers about Freud everywhere. Even new biographies come, even new stories about his nanny might have, in 1858, done this or that. So I think there are, there are many reasons about that. One, Freud was an excellent writer. He wrote in a way that captured the attention of many people. Many people liked reading him. He wanted to write about science, but many people admired his prose his literary style. Then another, Freud probably managed to take the best of everyone before him, of all the guys who wrote about the concept of the unconscious before him, and then add something to it. He was, in a way, a creative genius to a certain extent. So he gave maybe the best diagnosis for his time. He managed to really mirror, if you will, to describe what was going on then. Then third might be Freud, they say, provided the last myth of the Western civilization. Wherever you wanted to go in the 20th century with your thinking, you would somehow meet psychoanalysis. It was such a powerful model for our self-reflection that you would see it everywhere, in films, in cartoons, in literature, in science, everywhere. Then Freud, being a genius on the one hand, was, I think, a very unhappy person with certain limitations, overambitious, very narcissistic, sometimes cruel and cold. So then we see that inside him there is this, this controversy. And yet, many people wrote books there, I don't know how to estimate how many books, about this myth of Freud as a hero, of Freud as a messiah. So we had one period writing about him in an idealistic fashion, then we have one period writing about him in a very dark tone. So these are the first four things that come to my mind. An excellent author, who learned whatever was to be learned and could say something about his age, who provided for us a framework for thinking, and who was a very controversial human being. And there must be many completely different answers. No match. Sorry? No match. No match between mine and yours? Not at all. I think it's very simple. I, I think it has to do with one... Let's make the list. Please give me a second. Um. Okay. So science, science first. Science. Science. What does it mean? Freud did for science something that's extremely important. Freud's background was a neurologist. Yes. Yes. And he was, as far as I know, fighting any kind of metaphysics, all of his all, all science. There could be no religion, there could uh, be no metaphysics. Maybe I didn't get your question right. I thought we were answering the question why is Freud relevant today? Yeah. Okay. Because he was a scientist. Because he was the first to, to take the field of psychology into scientific, with the scientific community. Well, I tried to address that more than a month ago. There were these very important people before him, and then scientific world did not accept him very well. For, for a long time, they despised him as literature, as fiction. 
Yeah, I, I agree, but 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 I don't. You know, you, you talk about why is why is the speed so great? Mm -hmm. Okay, so science. Maybe we just make a list and then then we'll discuss it. Science. Okay, so that's here, or not? I think we have from the second. Second, anti-metaphysical, okay. Anti-metaphysical, okay, then? You said no match between my list and yours, so I thought you, you had your, your list already. Only one. Sorry. Uh, I, I I thought this would be my list. Then this would be Christians, and then we could make any any other as many others as you would like to. To choose one, I think dynamic and conscious. To have just one idea by Freud, it would be dynamic and conscious. Dynamic unconscious, the unconscious which influences the consciousness and is influenced by it. Is any totalization of Freud's crime? Sorry? He was faking. He was faking? Uh, what? An imperial journey to conquer the soul. You know? mm -hmm. Also, he talked about it. And yes. He the cigar, killed him. Yes. Writing letters and playing games. Yes. And yes. Yes. Ah, did he ever cry? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. So, so, in the Moses of Michelangelo and in the civilization and its discontents, he really does present himself like that. Whenever I lose control, then I cannot enjoy at all. I cannot enjoy music. I cannot enjoy oceanic feeling, anything feminine, and so on and so on. So, there is one episode when we know that Freud cried, and just one. 1938, is it, is it Gestapo or Gestapo? Okay, I always, I always wonder. They arrested Anna, and Anna was in prison overnight, and Freud cried. And the next morning when she returned, he decided to leave Vienna. He wouldn't leave Vienna until that moment, when he realized he might lose Anna. So that's the only moment when anyone saw him cry. Once in his life. He was happy. Sorry? When he was happy. Yes. He was weak. He was extremely weak. He would describe himself, I mean, he was 82 with these 30 operations. And he described himself as the old Oedipus and Anna as his Antigone. So she, he needed her to walk. When you see his photographs from the old age, from London, for instance, he always walks, Anna is by him, and then he is holding her hand. This is the only documented time he was crying. He yes. Was yes. When he was total, like a baby, an old person, connected to his daughter. <coughs> he was... I, I, I think your association uh, may, may be to the point. He was operated on more than 30 times. So each time they would cut more and more into his mouth. So at a certain point, I think around 1933, the whole bone was out. So it was not the prosthesis for the teeth, it was the prosthesis for the bone. So he was probably like a baby when it came to food, um, to talk was painful, to eat was painful, everything including mouth movement would be painful. And probably I imagine that his nutrition then was in a way baby-like. Because you know in religion, the basic thing that you can do is like any every day, every day if you pregnant the seed, if you read religious text, you are totally like this in the point of God. Let's say you are just becoming like a small woman, like a religious mm -hmm. woman. And I, I'm the one that thinks that all stuff, all quantified stuff, or whatever stuff is based on this sentiment of the thing. This really small child doesn't know what to do with the world. And 
talk about the person between you analyze it. But never was able to understand. Freud I think would never admit to anyone and probably would never admit to himself that he was helpless or that he was out of control. This very powerful mind was serving this function, to always have control, to speak all the languages, to know all the secrets, to understand everyone, to claim to understand yourself and so on and so on. And then hating music, being very distant when it comes to sexuality, very ambivalent when it comes to sexuality, being in a way despising femininity, being closed for oceanic feeling, tells you that this probably was a huge problem for him. There are ideas about that, yes? Yes, but, because what is, what is crucial to me in all of his writing is that he's always, he's self-critical and he has this, well, this is as far as I can say right now, but probably we're gonna change, maybe we're gonna change the whole thing later on. I know from, from, from your previous, uh, what is beautiful history that, that, that you can also attack Freud in many ways for being a scientific stubborn. But, but still, I, I think there's something in his writing uh, as the founder of psychology that, that sort of calls for this self critical attitude that, that we call science even today. And, and this is why I put up the, the, the science in Anton the physical thing first. As, a, as, as opposed to somebody trying to create a religion. I, I think what is very important, Freud is 23 volumes. So it's almost like Shakespeare. You will find in there whatever you're looking for. On top of these 23 volumes are probably 10,000 pages of correspondences. Some of it still not published. So you'll find there whatever you want, maybe like in religious texts, even things completely contradictory, he would claim very refined, very subtle things in his papers, and then in the correspondence he would be a completely different person. And then in relationships with some people he would be a completely different person. I don't think, for all my loyalty to psychoanalysis, I don't think Freud was the founder of psychology, if there was a founder of psychology, I think it was William James. Many people think it was Wilhelm Wundt. Actually, that sort of puzzles me that, that I, cannot, I cannot do the timeline for psychology versus yeah. psychoanalysis. So, Wilhelm Wundt founded the, the lab in Leipzig, 1879. William James published his most important book in 1891, The Principles of Psychology. Freud published the interpretation of dreams, 1900. But even William James, even he wrote the religious book. Yes, yes. Time, yes. He claimed himself as a religious experience. So all those, you know, big process, couldn't fit. This is what I, when I read the eruption, it's so rational, you know, it's yes. so elaborated about the theory. William James, William James was more open to it than Freud. William James went to spiritistic sessions. At that time, that was very popular. Jung did it, Ferenczi did it, many other people did it. William James did. To the best of my knowledge, Freud never did. Never even tried to think about it. When Jung would tell him there was something occult, Freud would say, no, 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 we must be rational. That was a big difference between them. I want to thank you wholeheartedly for the time and in a way for the passion for being here with me all the time and asking questions and everything. And I would like to ask you at the end, 